I had a Hungarian friend once said to me, you destroyed hardcore, man. He said, <laughs> I was like, okay, <laughs> sorry. Welcome back to another Last Words on the Pit. This week, we have Tomas, legendary singer of At The Gates. Hi, Tomas. Hey, how are you doing? Tomas, you're a legend, okay? That's pretty cool. Obviously, we're gonna talk about new music and all that jazz, but take us all the way back. You made an album that basically was a mic drop, in my opinion, right? Like a masterpiece to many people and really um, an album that defined a genre for you know many generations to come. At the time, did you know it was gonna be such a classic? Well, uh, I, would th- I will sound pretentious, but we wrote, we wrote it as an idea like to, to, to write a classic, actually, <laughs> we did. We were 22 years old. We were 22 years old. We, we thought we could write a classic if you just put our heads to it. And yeah, but it didn't become a classic until after we broke up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like a good decade later, everybody was like, oh my God, this is amazing. What was the process like? I mean, so you said you were, you were young, you had that bravado, been in tons of bands in between, but like, what was the process like putting that album together? And when you look back on it, what to you is one of your proudest moments? I guess for that album, we were really uh, kind of kind of disappointed with the music climate at the moment, like in, in the, the Metal Underground. We were like waiting for, for that album to come out in a way. So we figured we had to do it ourselves. We went back and listened to all the records that we thought were classics, you know, like the old, old Judas Priest records, the Dark Angel Slayer or whatever. And like what, what, what makes this album classics? How can we go around to do that? And that was like the big challenge for us because we had written all these complicated death metal records before with a lot of riffs and a lot of like, you know, death metal pop songs, I guess, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but it was hard. It's like that was our challenge then. And that's kind of weird that that became our, you know, legacy for quite some time. Because now we're a total different beast again. I guess we're known for the most generic record of our <laughs> career. So I'm probably one of the biggest At The Gates fans of all time. <laughs> my, my old band, God Forbid, was one of the first bands in the US along with Kill Switch Engage and Shadows Fall and Darkest Hour and Unearth and these bands to kind of glom on to that sound. And, I, and for me, it was like a one-two punch basically between what At The Gates was doing and what Carcass was doing. And it just kind of coincidentally, both bands broke up kind of around the same time and in a way created almost a vacuum, right? Where all of a sudden people like myself were discovering this music and falling in love with it. But then it allowed for bands like In Flames to kind of go through that pathway or Soil Work or Children children of of Bodom and and things like that. What do you think about that time period, because you talk about how it gained popularity after the band had had broken up. What do you think just changed during that time where all of a sudden people were kind of ready for that sound? Yeah, it's, it's hard to say. I mean, we, we still consider ourselves like a death metal band, or we still do, you know? It wasn't our idea to make it accessible in that sense, but to write shorter, more direct songs, as you referred to, kind of gave it a kind of more, uh, availability, I guess. I don't know, we, we were looking in all these different directions. We set up, saw ourselves as a death metal band. We also looked at hardcore and, and punk for the influences for the record. Like in the early 80s, like Slayer Metallica also did that to, you know, to find their sound. I guess we're like the, you know, we like Judas Priest as much as we like Black Flag kind of thing, you know? <laughs> uh, and I don't know, it's hard to say what came after because then I was like on my own little trip. I was 23 years old <laughs> when we broke up. And my idea was that At The Gates should go even more hardcore punk, you know, grittier or whatever, which of course the, <laughs> the, the others had a different idea about that. Um, so I, I formed all these more crusty punk bands after for a while and wasn't really aware of what was happening in the metal scene for quite a while actually, until some people said like, hey, these other guys are doing kind of what you were doing. <laughs> they ripped you off. <laughs> no, not ripped me off, but. No, it was more like, you know, people seemed to actually get what you were doing kind of thing. Not I mean, yeah, I guess that was a b- big compliment. We were still so young, so it's hard to grasp it. Well, I think of other albums too, like um, like even Swan Song, because I love that album. A lot of people don't love that album from Carcass, but I, I actually think it's- Swan Song. I love Swan Song. Yeah, you're, you're Stanford too. I, I think it's just an incredible album and it really shows like the musicianship and what they were capable of, right? To your point, 
some of the shorter songs, a little bit more of that rock and roll groove, but kind of like short and sweet. Um, and I think to some of those albums, and I think that they were really formative. And like Doc was saying, you know, some of the metal core that came kind of like right in that early 2000s period that was very heavily influenced by what you guys were doing, what Carcass was doing. Is there any of them that stand out or is there an album that stood out and you're like, wow, I influenced that or we influenced that? Well, I, I guess it's like the more, the, it's more the whole idea of that actually influencing someone at all is <laughs> overwhelming, you know? And when you see a lot of bands doing, I, I remember, not an album, I remember, I think it was Lou from Sick of It All, uh, he had an interview. I mean, we were big Sick of It All fans, of course, and he mentioned like they played some festival somewhere and he said, he said like, yeah, there were just all this young bunch of bands playing at the Gates Riffs. And like, <laughs> we felt so weird there because we thought it was a hardcore festival. And I'm like, ooh, did I do something bad here, <laughs> you know? <laughs> So it's, it's like both, you know, it's a, it's a compliment, but it's also like, yeah, but I, I loved hardcore and punk. I do. And all of a sudden, all the hardcore bands started, you know, playing stuff that maybe not all hardcore fans were ready for. I don't know. I, I had a, I had a Hungarian friend once said to me, he, play, he played in a metalcore band, uh, and he said, you destroyed hardcore, man. He said, <laughs> I was like, okay, no, yeah, sorry. You didn't mean to. And it's and the funny <laughs> thing is, so God forbid, we, in around 1998, we would cover at the gates. And yeah. this was when, when literally no one was playing guitar solos, no one was doing anything. So we were playing these hardcore shows and it was going over a lot of people's heads, right? But there would be like that, seven guys in the crowd who would get it and be like it'd be like the greatest moment of 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 their life so i was kind of there for that whole thing as it enveloped and i and i think me i was a fan of the whole genre right and so we had songs that were very much influenced by what you guys were doing but i think what you guys had done with that record that the reason why it had the impact was there was you know don't try to take this the wrong way there was like a formula to the set to, to that record of like okay, here's, everything has this triplet feel and it's going to have these type of chord changes and these kind of beats and people are able to hone in on that. But I think where people were against that was when people got too wrapped up in the formula. Yeah. We always felt it was like it was too easy. So we were like, here, let's take a little bit of it, but don't become like a clone, right? Let's do something new with it. No, no, I get that, yeah fans tend to really lock into the idea of formula, right? Like Unearth had the At The Gates riff, Breakdown, Iron Maiden part, that's the formula. Killswitch had the, here's the carcass riff, here's the big melodic chorus, here's the breakdown. And and then when people see that and it's successful, then they kind of jump in, you know, in terms of- Yeah, no, I get what you mean. The formula is easier to get hold of. So per se, but I always said, like in the interviews when we started to like do the reunion, I always said, like, yeah, I'm still waiting for like bands, hardcore bands starting ripping off Entombed instead, because that's more natural for a hardcore band to rip. And then, then that happened. <laughs> then that way, <laughs> then that, that way it happened after. I'm like, okay, I should shut my mouth. You're forecasting. I mean, there's also, you know what I noticed? Because I, I, I went back and listened to the record the whole way through the other day, um, knowing that you're going to be on. And honestly, I have like select songs in different playlists, but it, it really is such a moment in time where you could listen to a full album the whole way through. And it was just like a masterpiece because of the cinematic quality and the way that it weaved into the other songs. Like, and you know, bands don't, it's really difficult for bands and other artists in different genres to really think through a full album that way. Um, was that intentional for you guys? Or did you just like stumble upon that that order? No, I, I guess we, we we were very aware of it. As uh, I would say before, like with uh, going back to the classic albums. Now I'm going to touch upon the word formula again, Doc. Sorry, but you know, like you know, what made Master of Puppets, such, you know, to have such a flow, for example. And we looked at that. Okay, yeah, slow song there. You know, like yeah, trying to figure out like a middle middle part there that could break it down before that aggressive song kicks in. So we were looking at all these different things to make that full record because we 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 were old school metal fans in that sense that we wanted a full album, you know, that's what we wanted to hear. And we still think like that, you know, the song order is very meticulous. Totally. And like when Into the Dead Sky hits, you're just like, wow, this is like 
beautiful musicianship. <laughs> like when you just hear it, I mean, it was one of the things that struck me because I was used to, you know, me and Doc actually both grew up in New Jersey listening to like hardcore, right? And when you hear that, it's just like, I, you know, I'm a, I actually am a trained classical musician. <laughs> so like, it was like, wow, this is one of the first times for me that I heard something that where it was natural. And it was beautiful and it was just, it helped to position those things a bit. It's, it's hard to say like, but you know, we, we were 21, 22 years old, uh, but we had a plan. I, I, I don't know how we could be so. Sophisticated. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> but it's interesting. We use this term melodic death metal and you, even you kind of honed it on, on that, that term. And I wonder, and this is me because in the context of the late nineties, I would put it in those terms, but as, as I kind of, part of me almost, begs the question of whether the, the melodic death metal, is it really death metal? Is it really part of that? Is it, is it almost too catchy? Is it too listenable? Is it, is it, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I'm just kind of a, a question talk to both of you. Is it, does, yeah. or has it grown out of that, that phase to some degree? It's, it's hard to answer, I guess, because the melodic death metal, I don't know. Oof. It's so hard to actually even think about what that is because for, when we did Sword of the Soul, we were just a death metal band. We just happened to have some melodies here and there, you know, a little bit more. And again, it's the formula you talked about. If you think about the three bands from Gothenburg, we play in Star Tranquility and At the Gates, none of them sound the same at all. They just happen to be able to have a death metal bass and then have some more melody thrown into it, but it's different kind of melodic texture, you know? For us, we were always death metal, first and foremost. It's a very experimental death metal band, maybe, but on Store of the Soul, kind of, this is the experiment right now. Let's do a, like a, that kind of record. Guess what? No blast beats. Can you, <laughs> here's the real question. Can you be death metal without blast beats? I don't know. Oh, God. Well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, that's a, that's a, that's a good question. But for me, um, blast beats, if you would listen to early possessed and early death, there were no blast beats, you know what I mean? Repulsion it's introduced that. It's true, it's true. For me, death metal is not an aggressive music form. It's, it's, it's like a gloomy, scary, dark music form. Evil. Brash metal is aggressive and hardcore is, but death metal is not sent, like, that has, doesn't have to be aggressive, actually, in my, in my eyes. Potato, potato, huh? A little bit. Yeah, for, for us, we were grow, we grew up with the new wave of British heavy metal, close and then thrash metal. I mean, because we, I've said this before, but we grew up in the like the perfect world, so to say. We were seven years old when we heard Kiss. We were tw ten when we heard Iron Maiden. We were like thirteen when we, Metallica broke. You know, it's like and sixteen years old when we discovered death metal. When we got, could actually straight away form a band. So it's like the the ladder is there, whereas now people just have everything available at the same time. It's like, can you just choose, again, a formula and form your band around it? But whereas we had all this history for free, you know, because we grew up with it. Listen, my only final thought is to just thank you, Tomas, for being on the, the program. You've been such a massive, positive influence on my life. And I actually, so this is something, I did a painting. I did a giant At The Gates painting in high school. Wow. The old logo with like flames behind it. And <laughs> And I got the Bueller brothers to sign it when they did wow. the in 1999 uh, with the Haunted opening for Testament. So I need the, you know, the next time At The Gates comes somewhere, I need to get the entire original lineup on there. So yeah, yeah. you, I need Adrian, and I need Martin, another guitar player, to like lock it down. So just- How big is this painting? <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. It's probably- I don't know. Yeah, probably what thirty six by twenty four, something like that. So I keep some real in the streets. All right. Oh my god, Doc, what a true fan! I love it. It's beautiful to see that happen. <laughs> we want to make that happen, Doc. Don't worry. And by the way, it's the only like autograph of a musician I've ever asked for. <laughs> I don't care about autographs, but I was like, if you do a painting, then it kind of matters more. I have one autograph. <laughs> Ooh, Mr. Jim Durkin of Dark Angel. Because he forced me to sign his copy of Sword of the Soul, I said, no way. Then you have to sign this. <laughs> well, that's it for last words this week. Uh, we found out that Doc is a hella fan, which I love. It's really cute, Doc, to see, to see you so smitten. Tomas, where can we find you online? And I, by the way, 
I could not find you online. <laughs> Other than your, your band account, I crept. Yeah, it's only band accounts. I have zero social media. But at the Gates has, of course. Uh, you know, the usual Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Unfortunately, you can find me all over the internet at Zenakoto with two E's. Doc, where can we find you? You can find me at Doc Coyle, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Tomas, what you lack in social media, you make up for in sanity. So congratulations. <laughs> Well, if you want to tune in every Thursday, you can check out um, Last Words on the Pit. Uh, Get all your hot takes wherever you get your podcasts, which is pretty much anywhere at this point. Mm -hmm.